All right, hallelujah. Most of you have met my... <laughs> I've told you this before. I wish you weren't so shy. <laughs> really. My daughter, my wonderful son-in-law, this is my family. And, uh, except that my family has about 10 million more in it somewhere, scattered everywhere. At any rate, speak a word. <clears throat> uh, we just want to tell you that we sense revival in this place. I know you do. And this is a part of the kingdom of God that is growing like a seed and is getting ready to explode on the world. And yes, and we have been working on a book to help equip believers to train you, to equip you, to help you experience more of the presence of God, more of his glory realm, so that you can be a carrier of revival. And so we are all in this together. These are some articles that um, Dad wrote 20 years ago. We have re-edited them, put them together. All, covers all subjects, deliverance. The, and then Buddy wrote a couple chapters because we wanted to round out the book with um, the new birth and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So he's done a lot of research, and this whole book come, culminates with uh, the kingdom living, which is what we are all talking about this week. So we want to invite you to get this book. It'll be ready in a couple weeks, and you can pre-order it here, or we'll send copies here. And then last of all, Dad's book, Hooray and Hallelujah. This is his life story that he printed since we were here last time. So we encourage you to get this book. It's full of history. It's full of hysterical stories, which you know he loves to tell stories. And then it's also full of, chock full of lots of teaching information that you will be blessed by. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. Bless you. Say a quick word of prayer for me. All right. Father, we just thank you for your presence that we feel here. Lord, that's what it's all about. That's why the veil was torn, so that we would have access, Father, and that's our covenant right to come into your presence and to learn to uh, live in your presence and be a carrier of it. So, Lord, we just pray right now for Charles. You would anoint the word that he speaks, and as well as Jack and RT, Amen. Lord, all that is spoken and done Amen. would be for your glory and that uh, your anointing would be upon it, and our ears would be open to receive it in our hearts. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. 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 Well, I guess okay. you did the right thing in bringing it up. It, it, was all, it seemed like they had a plan. Uh, no, you, 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 since you're standing up, go ahead. Here, boys. RT, come here. One of these days, there'll be a slight pause. <laughs> well, I said slight, it may not be. One of these days, we're going to see RT grow up. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? He's just sort of a, you know, a teenager in his frustrating years. Come. <laughs> Come, and if you were to use five minutes for every book, we'd be here two years. He, uh, he, he used to go to England every two weeks and write a book every Thursday. And, uh, he now just writes a book every Thursday. Come on, speak to this group now, about... If, if Charles can have his family up here, you had your son, I thought it time for me to bring to Amen. Uh, Amen. Amen. I have a wife, too. Uh, T.R. is not a, he's not a public type person. He's, he's the uh, IT man. He's the one who does my website and looks after my books. But in the last year or two, whereas Louise used to travel with me, <laughs> uh, 
I don't want to deprive you of whatever it is you've been called to do. <laughs> oh my. I broke the microphone. Anyway, but um, Louise now prefers more to have the grandsons with her, and TR has been traveling with me more and more. Now, he didn't talk much, as you're going to find out, but do you want to say a word to, to these people? Hi. <laughs> but I... Thank you. Um, yeah, we love being here with you guys. It's, it's, uh, I wish... Wish you were in Nashville, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, yeah, we love being here. You guys have such a, a heart for the Lord, and there is revival here. It's awesome. So, word and spirit. It's great. Thank you. We have talked about you a lot today, and I want to say to you, this, as you know, is our 95th and almost certainly our final time together. And if I'm totally honest, I think I sense more enthusiasm and expectancy in you than any place we've been in the, in the last several years. And your pastor is leading you in the right direction. His heart is word and spirit and that is the need of the hour more than anything in the world. Not spirit without the word, not word without the spirit. It's the simultaneous combination that will result in spontaneous combustion and bring about the revival that we need. I do. I do have a wife. Use this and just use it. And I'm no good with this. I'll have to, will Okay. This is my wife coming. Would y'all shut up? Thank you, sir. Thank you. This must be family night. <laughs> um, as I said last night, we were so looking forward to coming here because we, these men, we have not been together this year at all. This is the first time this year that we are all together again and it's like a family reunion. And then to be here with you, that made it extra special. So thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming us the way you do. And we hope to be back again soon. I do at least. <laughs> And I, <laughs> the pastor and his wife, Miss Jan, she is a pearl. You have a beauty in this house, in her. And she has a heart for you as the congregation for every person. And she loves the Lord. We hung out this afternoon together. And I told her, <laughs> she has become such a wonderful friend. And my heart is going into yours. So God bless you. Thank you so much. And, and we expect you and Pastor to come to where we are very soon. We want to see you in our place as well, okay? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, um, since all these books are here, let me, <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about all of them, except I might as well plug my book in too, okay? <laughs> from Hitler's Germany, it's my adventure from Hitler's Germany to the cross of Jesus Christ. But you know, too many people stay at the cross. Yes, we sing this song, and I love that song, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. That's where I first saw the light. But too many of us are staying at the cross. That is like we are opening the door and we are standing in the threshold. We never experience what's inside, what's inside the room. So that means, the cross and beyond. What is beyond the cross? 
after the cross, when Jesus died, was buried, rose again. But before he left, his last words, people say it's in Matthew, okay, go into all the world. But that was not really the last word. I believe it's in Luke. What did he say before he ascended? He told the disciples, wait here. He says, wait. Too many of us are trying to run ahead in our own strength. But he says, wait. And I want you all tonight to wait on him. Wait on the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to come into you afresh and anew. Not just to, re to experience the tingle, which is a beautiful feeling. Okay. But to empower you, for you to be bold, to go out into the world then. And to preach the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus said, go out and preach the kingdom of heaven. And he said, repent. It is time for us to repent of all that our disobedience to Jesus Christ. And to be obedient to his word and to do his word. And this evening, if you bear with me one more moment, as we were singing again, Lord, I give you my all. You can have it all. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you my all. Everything I own. And I know you don't own your children. They are his. But so many times we feel like we act as if we own them. Okay? But be very careful when you sing those words or say those words to him. He knows your heart. I said that too at one time. And those were just words at that time. And then my son decided to check out of this world, to take his own life when he was 19 years old. He committed suicide. It's a hard thing to overcome. You cannot overcome that in your own strength. So that's why many doctors give you these opioids or give you uh, medication to numb your brain, to numb you, so you don't have to deal with it. So you, how do you overcome and be joyful in the end and walk in peace and even be thankful? I wrote it in here, the recipe. When that time comes, you may have friends, you may even be the one in have a family member that took his own life. You may know friends that took, have taken their life or their family. Get this book, give it to them. Because it is a hard thing to go through. It takes only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment, and by the love for Jesus Christ and the relationship, the deep relationship with him, because he has priority in our life. So before you sing those words again, be very sure. And there is a song, be very sure. I can't sing, but that's, there is a song, okay? Um, so be very sure every word you speak that you mean it. Okay, but there is joy in life and you can overcome because when Jesus came to this, Jesus said, um, if you have burden, you know, are you weak and heavy laden? Come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden. I want to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Okay, if you came in tonight with a burden, give it to him. He can handle it. And he wants to set you free from all your burdens so that you can have freedom in life, that you can be a testimony unto Jesus and not have a fake smile, but that it comes from within. And people will say, how can you handle this? How do you do it? And that's when you open your mouth and say, it's my Savior, my Lord, my Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
Has he left us? Okay, it's it's yours. Come on. You finished? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do, do your best. Do your best, Charlie. The verse I've been referring to every night, Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. Keep your eyes on the ark because you've never been this way before. But I want to add tonight another verse from Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. In some translations, Neither. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, one last time I ask for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Spirit upon every mind in order this, that the, the perception of everyone will be as you intend. There'll be no misunderstanding from lack of clarity. Cleanse my tongue, therefore, that I will be your transparent vehicle to pass on all that needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Help me to be clear simple. I ask that this will be life-changing and a word that brings great honor and glory to your name. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to see three things on this my last time with you. The first, the family secret. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God according to his purpose. When Joshua could say to the children of Israel, you've never been this way before. It's good to know that God knows where we have been before. And this is a word for everyone here. You need to know that God knows your past. He knows it perfectly. He knows the things that haunt you. Most of us, when we look at our past, can think of a lot of bad things, things that we regret. And the family secret is given to those who worry about the past. And the secret is God causes everything to work together for good in such a way that you're tempted to say, well, that's the way it was supposed to be. But then that would be a mistake because the fact that it works together for good doesn't mean that what happened was right at the time. But what happens is that God takes it and causes things to work out in such a way that you look back and say, I never would have dreamed. Look what God has done. And so you need to know that the God who has led you up to now has guided your past, has his hand on you as if there were no one else. You are special and God has a blueprint out on your life, past, present, future. And now the next thing, the present. Joshua now has come into the land of Canaan. And lo and behold, there's this awesome figure with a drawn sword. And Joshua said, who are you for? Us or our enemies? And the commander of the Lord's army, who's an angel, says, neither. That was not the answer that Joshua wanted. And many of us, when we seek the Lord, and we think we have heard from him, and we have, but we're not sure because we don't like the answer. We want everything that comes from God to make us feel good. But sometimes he makes us feel bad. 
so that later we will feel good and thank him for what he did. Now, what's going on here that this commander of the Lord's armies would say to Joshua, neither. What is happening? Well, I can tell you. The children of Israel needed to know something of the ways of God before they would see the first breakthrough when they go into Canaan and the walls of Jericho fall down. God said of the generation of Israel that just preceded 40 years, he said, they have not known my ways. God wants us to know his ways. And so as you are preparing for revival, and by the way, I have to tell you, revival is a sovereign work of God. You cannot make it happen. You cannot work it up. All you can do is pray for this. Well, in order to understand what is about to happen, we need to understand something of God's ways. The children of Israel, that previous 40 years, God says, they've not known my ways. But now, here's a new generation. He wants them to know his ways. And of all things, Joshua is told, I'm not for either one of you. Why was this the answer? The answer is that God is a God of glory, and he's on his own side, and he's not going to share his glory with another. Now, this is a hard lesson for us to learn. A number of years ago, I think over 55 years ago, one of my mentors, one of my earliest mentors, Dr. N.B. Magruder, he was a student of Yale. He's the one that introduced me to Jonathan Edwards. And I said to Dr. Magruder, it seems to me that the highest devotion one can have to the Lord would be to die as a martyr. Would you agree? He smiled, took out a pen and a piece of paper, and he wrote. Now, what he wrote... I've carried with me possibly the profoundest word I've ever heard. <clears throat> you may need time to absorb it. But here's what he said. My willingness to forsake any claim upon God is the only evidence that I have seen the divine glory. What is this saying? Well, I can tell you it's the opposite of the kind of God that has become popular in our generation. We live in a prosperity atmosphere, and it's come into the church. Name it, claim it, believe it, receive it, and we want what's making us feel good. And we only want what will show prosperity and this sort of thing. It's almost as though we all feel entitled. One of the curses of our generation is that everybody feels entitled. In order to understand the glory of God, we come to the place that we realize we are not entitled. This is why when a person is first converted, he says, God be merciful. To me, a sinner. A sinner. Do you know what it means when you ask for mercy? When you ask for mercy, it means you have no bargaining power. In other words, you cannot snap your finger and say, God, you have to do this. He would just look at you and say, really? And this is what the commander of the Lord's army was teaching. He is for neither. He's for his own glory. And we must love his glory. Jonathan Edwards taught us that the one thing that Satan cannot produce in anyone's life is a love for the glory of God. If you have a love for the glory of God, good sign. Satan would not do that. He could not. The flesh could not do that. But a love for God's glory... Then you may say, well, 
asking God for mercy, that's one thing. But that's when we get converted. You might be surprised to know that the first thing every Christian should ask for every time you pray is the same thing. I remember saying a few weeks ago on uh, my Twitter account, I said, what is the first thing you ask for when you come to God? What's the first thing? And many have not realized that according to Hebrews 4.16, the writer says, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Mercy. Why mercy? It's because we have no claim on God. We are not entitled to anything. It's like the leper. The leper who came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you will, you don't have to, you don't have to, but if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I will. You see, that's the attitude. And when we ask God for mercy, we realize that we are dependent upon him. And that is exactly what Joshua is having to learn and understand the next great move of God will be an act of God's mercy. Some years ago, uh, my wife and I were driving in Miami Beach, and we were going down Collins Avenue. Many of you know it, all the hotels, 17 miles. We came in front of the Fontainebleau Hotel. We're driving about 35 miles per hour and came to a traffic light. It was green, and then it turned yellow. Next thing I knew, it was red, and we were going 35 miles per hour, went on through. And out of somewhere came a blue light in my rear view mirror. And I thought, oh no. I pulled over and the policeman was just like this. He knew that I knew what I did. There's no use saying, well, why did you stop me? I just said to him, please don't give me a ticket. He says, why? I said, well, I'd appreciate it. He said... He said, give me one reason I should not give you a ticket. He said, sir, you went right through that red light. You went right through that red light. Why shouldn't I? I said, well, I do think that where we live, the lights stay yellow just a little longer. <laughs> uh, and we were going 35 miles by. He said, the speed limit is 25. <laughs> and now he could arrest me for something he hadn't even stopped before. I said, please don't give me a ticket. He said, give me one reason. I said, I'm asking for mercy. He let me go. I never will forget it. But here's the point. We need to realize this is what the children of Israel did not know and what Joshua was having to learn. And so, as the children of Israel now are coming to the walls of Jericho, they're told to walk around the, the walls of Jericho every day for seven days, and then on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. I want you to think about it. How do you suppose these children of Israel felt they're walking around the walls of Jericho, the, the city? They're not allowed to say a word. They're quiet. They're just walking. They must have felt stupid. And the people inside Jericho, what are those crazy Israelis doing? They're just walking around. And here's the thing. In order to be what God wants you to be, you've got to be willing to look stupid. Amen. It is part of bearing the stigma. The stigma, it's the offense. When intelligent people will think, you're crazy. Educated people, you've lost your mind. And it hurts when they say, that's dumb. But that's what the children of Israel did. And then on the seventh day, they walk around Jericho seven times. And you might have thought, all this time, surely there's going to be some sign of a breakthrough. Some evidence this is why I'm saying to you, what is coming? The next great move of God it will come suddenly. Amen. Suddenly. Amen. Don't expect looking for this or that. Oh, there's a sign. This is a sign. Well, there might be that for some. But as they walked around, 
the city of Jericho, there was not a hint that God was at work. They were just doing what God said. And that's what we have to do is we wait on God. We want to see him work. We look stupid. We feel stupid. People say we're stupid. Be willing to look stupid because this is part of the stigma. And the stigma is bearing the glory of Christ. And that is what honors God. And so they walk around the seventh time. No evidence at all. And then Joshua gives the order and say, shout together. And they did with a roar. And the walls fell. Was it what they did? No. The commander of the Lord's armies. You see, Joshua learned that it would be the Lord's armies that would do it. It wouldn't be Joshua. It wouldn't be the people. The Lord's armies. You need to know that in this room, there are angels all over. They are here. And this is what is happening behind the scenes. And that was what Joshua was to learn. Remember, we don't snap our fingers. We are aware we deserve nothing. And that's why we ask for mercy. You see, the leper, he knew his place in society. He was rejected. But he saw in the person of Jesus a compassion. And one, this leper said to himself, I think I could go to him and he would not reject me. And so he said, if you will, if you will, you don't have to. But if you will, you can make me clean. And I would suggest to you, we've got to learn this. We don't snap our fingers. This is what the children of Israel were to learn before they saw the great miracle. And I think that's what partly what we're being taught in a generation that waits to see a revival an awakening is coming. It is coming that will surpass every awakening in history, the greatest since the day of Pentecost, and it is coming. It is coming. It is coming. And it is coming soon. Thank you. Stand with me for just a moment. Will you do that? I have just a few minutes to share with you a God happening that occurred to me this afternoon. And uh, I think it will bring to a, a climax the meaning of our being here and what is happening to you and what will happen to you in the future. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to so respond to what you have said to us, what you've said in our hearing individually, and what you've said to us as a crowd on earth looking toward God coming to take his world back. Thank you and praise you for churches set to do that and for Revived Church particularly. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. We have, thank you, be seated. We've all lived in under sort of a shadow. We've mentioned it. I think we've mentioned it sometimes with uh, too much uh, feeling of sadness. Uh, in uh, the aging process, uh, you, you get to say or have to say goodbye too many times. And uh, I, I have a problem with that. But there is one hello after that that will wipe away all the bad feelings about having to say goodbye on this particular trip. I had a, a, an experience this afternoon. I knew that something was coming forth, and uh, in a minute I would sit down with two of my longtime friends, uh, Charles 
and RT. And uh, I heard coming out of my mouth words, something like this. Um, we, we had no thoughts, no dreams, no sense of expectation about what to expect as we stood talking or sat studying the, the next years of our lives. And we've lived growing certifiably old. Certifiably old. Now, some of you are old and you haven't admitted it yet. <laughs> but there'll be a time when your old body will say to you, Hey, hey, I'm old. <laughs> Began to treat me like I'm old. And in two weeks, I became certifiably old. After hours of, after hours of visiting with God, he counseled me regarding my mortality. I don't think I'd ever faced it. I had no intention of dying. And yet I found myself facing death and doctors agreeing with me. And uh, I, I, God brought some things together in the deep afternoon today. I will see each other, sure. The chances are good that uh, we, we'll be invited back individually, but uh, I'll not live in Florida. Frida and I are moving as soon as we can make arrangements to Texas and uh, where I'll be with my son. And by the way, uh, please go to the book table. I will deliver you from... Uh, bring me some water. I will deliver you from the <coughs> necessity of uh, having to hear about my books. Um, so I want you to go by and, and buy a book. Full price. <laughs> and uh, read it. I wrote one on the kingdom. It will prove to be my best one. And uh, I, will, I will write again. But this is what I heard about you and us. A reviving is like growing up. It's like moving towards something. Though an experience, that experience becomes a relationship. That relationship becomes a system whereby human beings can see light in us and we in them. And what I heard today was this reviving is at a spot where the next move of God is the message of healing. Healing. Right at this moment, there are things in you that are slipping the wrong way. There are system failures, just as my heart has announced its failure. And uh, I, I, I spent some moments thanking God for the past, celebrating God for the now, but uh, absolutely excited about the future. This church soon will explode. Everybody will be gathered in one place, and you'll be celebrating. And revival will explode like, a, like an atomic explosion. I can tell you that. I know that in the spirit, and I know it from reports. But I want to announce to you that the greatest fact about a kingdom church is that it is a healing church. Yes. To touch that church is to touch a system that guarantees you'll be better tomorrow than you were today. Amen. And you will continue to be better until one day 
we wake up in his presence and we will be perfect. We will be perfect. We will know as we are known. And so I, I, I believe there are people here tonight who need healing. I believe there are at least a dozen people who need a touch of God. The fact is, while I'm talking these moments, you can get that touch. You've experienced three or four things at the same time long before this. I believe there are several of you that carry about in your body the marks of dying. That which you possess will take you to heaven. That's not bad. That's just factual. But God can touch you and make every breath you breathe a breath of purpose and a breath of joyful appreciation and expectation. So I want you to begin to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Now that puts it in, in a wonderful, wonderful uh, situation and perspective. He is our Father. He has a destiny for every one of us. And he is carrying out that destiny with the rapidity that our wills allow. You will leave this service tonight in better condition than when you came. That is the nature of the perspective of the believer. And so I, I want to tell you that tonight some people are going to be healed. You're being healed right now. You're putting up with something that you've made a lot of complaints about. But tonight you're going to uh, not make any more complaints but praise the Lord that he made you with everything that can be under God's fix and help you have an experience of healing. That is in the will of God for you. There are some of you that have a, a, an attitude, a disposition, need of change. Uh, others of you have regrets that you can't seem to touch and can't seem to ditch. But God can heal that. There is not a problem you can dream of having or have that cannot be touched by the God of heaven. Amen. And God touches people in time of revival. Amen. I saw in our church years and years ago, as God moved in, the whole personality of the church changed. The whole attitude of individuals uh, was reversed and revised. And uh, I'm praying for that right now, that you will look at what ails you. Let God say what he wants to say and get on with the healing process. Amen. And from this moment on, from this night on, wherever and whatever happens in this church and to this church and to the world through this church, you will experience that upward mobility of a kingdom-seeking, kingdom-preaching, and kingdom-loving church. And that happens right now. God, right now, is depositing in you the equipment to handle everything that these final years of time on this earth are bringing to us. Though nobody's ever faced a world like ours, we can face it. God would not let us be born, would not let something happen that we could not face in him. And so in the process of that, sickness comes because we need healing. And healing comes because God is always ready to straighten out what the enemy has made crooked. Yes. So I want to urge you to, to believe tonight. I, I believe there are two or three people that are facing uh, something worse than I'm facing. You see, it, it's not bad facing what I'm facing. It's not a bad thing when the best thing you can think about is dying. Hey, uh, that's, that's not any fun to think about, you think. But, I, but you are in the same boat I am. You are a breath away from seeing him face 
to face. That's not bad. That's good. And so I want to urge you tonight before you leave this place to find that touch of God upon your life in some place where you may not even have become aware, but you hurt. There is a pain deep in you, maybe an emotional pain, maybe a, a, a physical pain, maybe a pain of attitude, regret, or so on. And so I think it was I think it was made clear to me beyond anything I've ever heard. When I walked into our staff meeting a little late, I began to tell my friends about this. And they were in agreement that uh, I had the liberty to say what I felt like God wanted me to say. Now, here's the deal. About two weeks ago, I had an experience in which I thought I heard the breath of death in my body. It was one of those things that when you breathed out, when your breath stopped, there still was a little tune. You've heard it. And I was reminded that my body was telling me something about the future. And uh, I... Uh, I'm, I'm not telling you something that has saddened me because here's the glad thing about it. I said, God, if I continue to feel like I'm feeling right now, I won't make it in a couple of weeks in, in this wonderful, exciting time of joining the church, Revive Church, in uh, a look at what God wants to do. And they were in agreement that I, that I announced to you, if this is what I felt, that uh, the position, the crossroads of this church at this moment is that anybody who walks through that door with something wrong can expect it to be right before they leave. Anybody, anybody sick can expect to be better before they're through. The preaching of the word, the singing of the praises, the moving of bodies in expectant, in expectant worship, and God will make you better. And people will look you up and come and see you and listen to you and watch you, and you, this will be a healing church. So I want to suggest that to you. There are many other things I could say, but I give you this passage of Scripture. That has been mine for years. I've, I've found it absolutely miraculous. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now get it. We have a little difficulty. We don't have a great difficulty with that. A little perhaps. But here's what we have difficulty in. And this is where we lose the glory of prayer if we're not careful. When you pray, when God hears your voice, when something within you cries out to your God, this is the confidence that we have in Him that when we ask anything, that is according to his will. And that's a wide if. A wide if. And it's yours. If you ask whatever. And then it says, if we know he hears. Do you realize what it says next? We know we have right now. Look at your body. Look at your life. Observe your feelings. Study the flow of your blood, the beat of your heart, the length and weakness of your step, and praise God that there is a spiritual system driven by the Spirit of God in you. And you'll be better in a moment. And one day there'll be a decision of God 
to take you home, and you'll be absolutely perfect. So I want to tell you tonight, as far as this preacher is concerned, this church will have made, it wouldn't have made any difference how many are here, how many are not, but it has happened. God has brought you, brought you to the position of healing. People can walk in the building and experience healing. People can listen to you with live streaming, and it happens. And my time is up, and this is what I want to tell you. I bless you with the understanding that, that you are on a journey with God. A journey in which God will do and finish His work. And I want you to celebrate that. I want you to receive it. I want you to be a part of it. And I will pray over you as I prayed over 4,500 last night. Mercy, mercy. And some of, some of them came, some of them came through eight times. But I, I said, Holy Spirit baptism, Holy Spirit filling, Holy Spirit empowerment. That's all we need. And that is yours. And on this evening, it happens. That's where you are and living within your reach corporately and within your determination individually is the fact that you can be a part of a healing process, yes. a victorious process. Yes. The answer to everything lies here. In Jesus' name, Amen. thank you for letting us come. You will be in our prayers. Put us in yours. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the acknowledging of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. As his divine power has given to us all things. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. <clears throat> Following Jack's message on healing, he reminded me of something that happened in my ministry years back. Uh, when I was pastor, and I've seen many healings occur since my traveling ministry began, especially in the area of deliverance. You remember that the woman who came to Jesus bent over and could not straighten up. He did not actually heal her. What he did, he said she had a spirit of infirmity, commanded the spirit to go, and she was instantly able to stand erect. Now, there was two things that happened. It appeared that she was healed, when the reality was she was delivered from a spirit of infirmity. One of my church members years back, a nurse, came to me and said, Pastor, said, I'm caring for a little Jewish lady uh, who's in a hospital bed, can't move or speak, would you come pray for her? And I remember getting another brother in the congregation. We went. It was in 
one of Delray Beach, Florida's very expensive communities in a very expensive home. We got there, and the nurse met us at the door, took us back to the bedroom, and there, with the bed rails up, lying in a hospital bed, was a tiny little form of this Jewish lady. I doubt that she weighed a hundred pounds. And she was curled up in a prenatal position on her side, could not move, could not speak. We obeyed Jesus. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. He also instructed his disciples to anoint with oil. Now, there's no magic in oil. Just as there's no magic in the water of baptism and no magic in the bread and wine of communion. But there is great power in obedience. The power is not in the element. The power is in the obedience. At any rate, we stood there at her bedside just for a moment, prayed over her, anointed her with oil in the name of the Lord, and left. It was about two weeks later, my secretary called me and she said, Pastor, someone is here to see you. So I went out to the outer office and there was a little lady standing there who said, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, no. She was dressed in what I remember a silk pantsuit, I think had on gloves. Her hair was very nicely done. And she said, I am the little Jewish lady you prayed for a few weeks ago. I was absolutely dumbfounded. I was unable for a moment to speak. The day that we had prayed for her, she never moved. She never responded. She never showed any kind of response at all. But what had happened... She was in what appeared a comatose state, but she heard everything we said. And that was significant to me, to know that someone who appeared in the condition physically and mentally um, was in as well off as she was. At any rate, she was healed. Now, her healing, while it was partly a physical healing, the major aspect of it was that she had a spirit of infirmity. And she told me, she said, that day you were there, I heard everything you said. Said, I wanted to speak, but I couldn't speak. And then later, the nurse came back to me at the church a couple months later, and she said, Pastor, you don't know the follow-up of that healing. Said, when she was in that position, paralyzed in bed, she said her family stood at her bed and argued about her will. She heard every word of it. She said when she got well, she went back to the lawyer and changed it. <laughs> now when Jesus gave that commission to the disciples to heal the sick, he was not meaning this is only going to be for a day or two and then it's all going to disappear from you. Nor did he intend that healing disappear when the first apostles died. We've all inherited that heresy, and it is heresy, because the gospel of Jesus Christ has never lost its initial power. What has happened is that the church has lost its ability to believe. And for the first 30 years of my ministry, while I saw healings take place, I never understood that there was actually in the Scripture a theology for healing. And Cecile, my daughter, may remember this particular healing. She would have been a very little girl at the time. But we had a young couple in the church in Atlanta, which is where my first pastorate was, who had a new baby. 
and the baby was in the crib in the living room. The mother went into the kitchen to heat the bottle for the baby and had it in a pot on the stove of boiling water. What she didn't know when she was standing there that the little sister had pushed the baby's carriage up right behind her. She picked up the pot of boiling water, turned, stumbled, and dumped the boiling water onto the baby. It struck its chest, part of its face. The water ran under, along the side and then under the, the back. It happened on a Saturday night. And um, when I shared with the congregation the next morning that the doctors had told her, said, told the mother, that if the baby lives, which they doubted, if the baby lives, said she will be at least a year in the hospital undergoing surgery and skin grafts. Well, on Sunday morning, when I told that to the church, the whole congregation just melted because this was a baby that everyone knew and everyone loved. I shared it with them. And then we stood and sang an old hymn. You probably have never heard it because I'll, I'll say this kindly. <laughs> <clears throat> It's, it's difficult to even be kind in some places I go, but there is so much holy gospel truth in the hymn book that modern generations do not know. I want you to clap again. That, <laughs> We stood, now this was a Baptist church, and a Calvinistic Baptist church, but we stood and we sang the hymn, the great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus, he speaks the drooping heart to cheer, oh hear the voice of Jesus, sweetest note in Mortal tongue, sweetest sound in angel song, blessed name ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. That singing that hymn, there are other stanzas, but singing that hymn was the high point of the whole congregation the whole congregation coming together in a sudden bond of agonizing prayer in behalf of that baby. I told the congregation, the doctors have said she'll be in the hospital for a year undergoing surgery. But the fact was, two Sundays later, I held her before the congregation, <laughs> raised her shirt. She was healed. <laughs> She was healed. Never went back to the hospital. Now, she would be close to 70 years old today, and I presume is still alive. And she had some scars. One small scar on her face, other scattered scars on her body. But the fact was, the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon that child in response to our prayer. Now, what do I think if the church had never prayed? I think the consequence would have been exactly what the doctor said. But we were driven to our knees. We were driven knowing that God Almighty was the only solution we had and that there was no other. How can it be then that some of the times we pray, the prayers go unanswered? Answer number one to that, 
falls into the reality of the sovereignty of God, that we may be just as earnest, just as yearning, just as hurting in heart. And please know that this is the most conciliatory truth of Scripture you will ever hear. Every physical, spiritual woundedness and injury is ultimately, totally healed in the resurrection. In that sublime moment, when we are raised, fashioned like unto his own glorious body, but this time without any taint of sin upon us. Can you imagine what that will be like? And the fact that your spirit already is redeemed, washed in the blood, infused, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, and at the moment of death zips out of you and goes instantly into the presence of God, and the body, the resurrection, greatest mystery of the universe, most unexplainable truth of Scripture. I'll give you the example of that. Roger Williams, First Baptist Church in America, was awesome, awesome, wonderful man, died. Rhode Island, the colony, the Baptist colony that he established, died and was buried. Later, an apple tree sprouted in his grave. The roots of that apple tree went down into the spot of the tomb, absorbed the elements of his ashes and bones, carried them right out into the fruit. Every neighborhood child ate apples off that tree. And the elements in the apple had once been part of Roger Williams. And that fact was, they even talked about the children who ate Roger Williams. <laughs> totally off our chart of explanation, totally beyond our conceptual ability, totally out of reach, even spiritually, of our comprehending it, but not beyond the power of God. That he who has begun a good work in you, he who has begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Resurrected, yes. How? God only knows. But in that moment of the resurrection, it's not going to be, you know, the scene at the local cemetery with these bodies just coming out of the hole. That isn't what has to, that cannot explain it. Not in view of the fact that our bodies go back to the initial elements of, of the earth and are passed on generation after generation after generation after generation. That is still no complication for God. How can we explain it? We can't. We're totally powerless to comprehend it. But the scripture teaches it. Do we believe it? We absolutely do. We'll never surrender it, knowing that in the resurrection, the body resurrection, we shall be changed, formed like unto the image of Christ. <clears throat> the dead in Christ will meet him in the air. The living at the time of the resurrection will meet Christ in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Yeah. Look at your body. <clears throat> You've got problems. I have a wounded eye I've had since I was three years old from an accident. We've all been victimized by life, by tragedy. Every bit of it 
will be wiped away. And I think of that dear little Jewish woman standing in my office, totally healed, a believer now in Jesus Christ, because she heard everything we said, that we anointed her in the name of Jesus. We prayed for her in the name of Jesus. She was healed in the name of Jesus, stood up, got out of bed in the name of Jesus. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.